Hey everyone, Mickey here for a mini Wikipedia episode and this week I am talking about fasting and particularly giving a perspective as to whether or not you should train to your menstrual cycle and regardless of that, what are some tips and tricks that I can provide you to help make that fasting process easier for you. So first and foremost, the obvious question, can you fast if you're a woman? You absolutely can. And do you need a special sort of regime that fits into your menstrual cycle? As I see a lot out there, there are books written about this so much on social media around how to optimize fasting to suit your menstrual cycle. Actually, you don't. And what you really need is intuition to determine how you feel regardless of your cycle. This is how to determine if a time-restricted eating protocol, TRE, another name for intermittent fasting, is actually working for you. And fasting can work well under certain conditions, or it can completely bomb. As it stands now, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest this is due to the phase of your menstrual cycle. But instead, other hormonal shifts may impact on how well fasting works for you. Of course, some studies do exist, and I'll link to a blog post I've written about this so you can see the uh, references to this, which do show a beneficial effect in the luteal phase of the cycle, which is often the time where you're told you shouldn't be fasting. Because this these studies have found there's an increased parasympathetic nervous system response and it actually lowers cortisol. Despite it being a very small study, research is there to suggest it's actually better to do in the luteal phase. And of course, other studies have been conducted which report no changes in hormonal pathways that control estrogen and progesterone release. Research that is robustly in favour of fasting is that which is conducted around metabolic health. Studies have found that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, can benefit from a TRE protocol with positive changes in their blood sugar control and level of inflammation over a five-week period. And in another study, intermittent fasting and reducing the eating window to nine hours which would be the equivalent of eating from 11am and finishing at 8pm, improve glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes. In women who carry excess body fat but had a normal blood sugar control, fasting doesn't appear to negatively impact on hormones such as estrogen or prolactin, which, when this is high, reduces testosterone and estrogen production. And when studying the relative benefits comparing premenopausal and postmenopausal women of an extended fasting window, weight loss and me- metabolic changes, which were all favorable, were the same. So there's no difference in fat loss found after eight weeks or any other, other measures, regardless of whether you were premenopausal or postmenopausal. So fasting may work well if you are someone who does have a level of insulin resistance, such as the PCOS example, and for people wanting to improve their blood sugar control. If you have excess fat to lose, then it can also help mitigate the potential pain of calorie restriction. Restricting the time frame with which you eat can reduce the number of calories that are consumed, thus easily creating a calorie deficit for some. Ultimately, though, it is no more effective than having the same number of calories but spread over a longer eating window. Thus, if weight loss is a goal, then this is one tool in the toolbox, and it isn't particularly magical, though if it works for you, it can definitely feel like it is. The thing is, though, fasting doesn't work for a lot of people, or it doesn't work the way they expect it to. In the short term and in the initial stages of doing it, it can feel effortless. However, over time, and many clients have reported this, many people experience diminishing returns. This tells us that ultimately the initial calorie deficit that is created from skipping a meal is no longer being elicited for two reasons. The first reason being that the calories dropped 
can be more than made up for through extra calories in the eating window. What we eat or don't eat early on has a significant impact on appetite and hunger later in the day, particularly if you are in the habit of early morning training with just a coffee or pre-workout on board. While getting through the morning with no food on board is tolerated, especially if you are working and busy, and so many people report that this is the case, it is later in the afternoon where you can experience more hunger despite having a good amount of food for lunch and dinner, as the lack of calories creates more of a distraction and you are unable to concentrate. So whilst in the morning you are fine, when things tend to ease off a little bit later in the day, this is when fasting or too aggressive of a fasting protocol can really let people down. One of the most common things I hear is that people find it difficult not to graze throughout the afternoon or after dinner. Despite feeling full, they are just not satisfied. Further, if you skip a meal in the morning, you may be more likely to let other things slide into your diet because it feels like there is more of a, bu- a buffer. Essentially, you sort of let yourself off the hook. Often these are energy-dense foods where you consume far more calories than you would otherwise. Think of a spoon of peanut butter in the jar, a handful of cashews, or three. Cheese, which a lot of people turn to because it's low carb, but it is energy dense. In essence, we can let ourselves off the hook a little and to the detriment of the calorie deficit. And the second reason why that calorie deficit diminishes isn't so much to do with the calories we take in, but more the calories that we burn, so that other side of the energy balance equation. First, let me address these changes that occur and then relate to this to why the calories we burn may ultimately be less. So fasting does change our physiology. It upregulates pathways in the body that are responsible for our inflammation and our antioxidant pathways. It reduces oxidative stress. And research has also shown that despite what I mentioned earlier about fasting helping reduce cortisol, a prolonged 72-hour fast can in fact increase fasting cortisol cortisol levels, which can increase resting energy expenditure. This is one of the reasons why you will read that there is a metabolic boosting effect of fasting. However, despite this relative increase in our REE, or resting energy expenditure, clinically speaking, fasting may reduce another part of our energy expenditure, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. NEAT is the activity that we do outside of activity, which we can be aware of, such as walking around the office, to the car, etc., and also not aware of, such as fidgeting or tapping our feet. And this has been found to be significantly decreased when someone is in a calorie deficit. If you put into practice a time-restricted eating protocol where you drop calories significantly, but you also reduce your spontaneous activity, then that calorie deficit can be diminished. This may especially be the case if you exercise or train fasted in the morning and extend out the period before your first meal. Now, I know this isn't everyone, but it's a lot of people. And the other thing outside of training, and this isn't everyone, but clinically speaking, what I hear many people report is that they are less active out of their structured activity. So they just move less during the day. And that is that NEAT that I was referring to. In addition, if you do train fasted and don't eat after training, some people also find their ability to push hard in the workout is compromised. So the metabolic output, the calories burned during exercise are also less. Combination of these two factors that I just talked you through, both the eating more calories than you intended or doing less activity than you planned has a net effect of being a stable energy balance and therefore you're not in a deficit and you will not lose weight. People can also experience a disruption in their sleep. This may further impact their motivation for activity. And this is due to the release of melatonin, our sleep hormone, which 
while it might not might not change its diurnal pattern, meaning it still increases and decreases as we would expect, studies have shown that it may delay the inc- the release of melatonin by about 81 minutes. So this will increase the time it can take to fall asleep. As always, more research needs to be conducted in the hormonal side of things. However, the potential change can result in changes in your motivation and desire to be as active as you might normally. And this can completely compound the impact that you experience on your ability to be active and the changes in need. So these changes can occur that change how you feel and how you respond to a fast, including the appetite changes, the energy changes, and the physiological changes that then determine whether this will be a successful strategy for fat loss. It doesn't have to be detrimental to your cycle, though, and if anything, the research conducted, as I suggested earlier, might actually say the opposite. So, the changes that occur that change how you feel and how you respond to a fast, and these include the appetite changes, the energy changes, and the physiological changes, isn't necessarily related to your menstrual cycle, but it's actually just common phenomena that happen to people who embark on a time-restricted eating protocol. Not everyone, but certainly the people where this isn't successful. So what I want to do is help share some tips that allow you to better improve your success with this method if you want it or choose to use it and develop an individual tolerance for it. And when I say tolerance, what I mean to say is that, you know, fasting is this additional stress on the body. So if you layer fasting onto a hectic and busy schedule, a disrupted sleep pattern or too many late nights and early mornings, a demanding exercise or training regime, then it can backfire pretty quickly. Because as with anything, more stress doesn't necessarily make us more resilient if it ends up being more than we can handle over time. So if you want to make it work, here are some tips. First, remember, there is no ideal fasting protocol to work with you, your age, or your menstrual cycle. So my best advice is to implement something and then evaluate over the course of a couple of weeks. Setting the scene for a fasting protocol can also be helpful, especially if you are one of the majority of of us who have an eating window that extends beyond 15 hours. Think a latte at 6am and then finishing the night with a cup of tea and a biscuit at like 9 o'clock. So this does mean putting some preparation work in before doing the fasting or the time-restricted eating protocol to optimize your chance of success. The first thing to do is to cut snacking out of your day. As one of the pitfalls for some is this increase in calories outside of mealtimes through grazing during the afternoon, you are better knocking that habit on the head first so you don't have the expectation to snack and inadvertently take on more calories outside of mealtimes than you would otherwise. This will involve some discipline, especially if you are used to snacking at certain times of the day. So it will be a little bit of white knuckling it initially, but you will adjust. Your body anticipates when you will eat based on previous experience. So we get a bit of a hunger hormone boost that then settles down if we don't end up eating anything. Part of that adjustment should also include increasing your meal size as well. Adding volume and protein to your meals will make you feel satisfied and less likely to want to snack. A rule of thumb is to add an additional 25% of lean protein to your meals. So if you currently eat 100 grams of cooked meat, bump that up to 125 grams. And another half a cup at least, of non-starchy cooked or raw vegetables. Anything that will allow you to feel more satisfied and less likely to want to graze outside of your meal times will work. So these are just starting guidelines. Second, the week before you begin, stop eating in the evening time after dinner and make your dinner rich in protein, if not already. So have a higher protein load in the evening as this can impact favorably on appetite and hunger the next day. 
This way, you also start to pull back your eating window without even realizing it and potentially get the opportunity to target another behavior, i.e. snacking after dinner, that might not be serving you. Often what we eat after dinner isn't necessarily something that falls into that essential nutrient category and is much more likely to fall into that treat or fun food category. You know I'm a big fan of protein and ensuring you get a minimum of 30 grams of quality protein will help with its satisfying effects. So I mentioned earlier to add additional lean protein to your meals. When you bump up your meat, for example, to that 125 grams, that will absolutely help you sort of push past that 30 grams of protein. And if you are vegetarian, you do need to actually boost that a little bit more by another, say, 30%. My third tip is to plan the days you are going to implement some intermittent fasting and the days where this might not align with your goals. For example, if you enjoy going to your favorite training class at 5 a.m. three mornings a week, it will be harder to stretch out your fasting window than, say, if you woke up at 7 a.m. and just went straight to work. Often, as I mentioned earlier, we need to ensure adequate calories to help recovery from these training sessions. And to have a fasting day might be detrimental to your next workout. There is no evidence that in order to be effective, consecutive days fasting or fasting daily even is the best way to achieve results, particularly with fat loss, which is pretty much what I'm talking about here. From a calorie deficit perspective, any days of lower intake or shortened eating window will help achieve this because it is a calorie budget across a week and not necessarily over this 24-hour period where we often think about it. Preclinical trials have also noted favorable metabolic changes when fasting is conducted even three to four days a week and not necessarily every day, thus providing flexibility to manipulate this according to your schedule and aforementioned sort of workouts or training schedule. In truth though, there are no human trials to determine the optimal number of fasting days or how these might be best structured across the week. Noting how you feel, what your hunger levels are like, your overall mood state, if sleep is impaired or enhanced, and also your progress for fat loss as a goal will all help you determine what might work best for you. You really have to be your own best investigator in this area. My fourth tip is that when you do break the fast the next day, choosing a more savory option rather than sweet can be helpful for regulating hunger across the course of that day. A savory meal, such as one that has an unami flavor, has been found to signal to the body that protein and nutrients are about to be delivered. And this actually reduces appetite later for food. And as I said, references to this information will be found in that blog post that I'll be posting about this. A high protein breakfast has been found to reduce the secretion of the hunger hormone ghrelin over the course of the day and decrease the gastric emptying rate of the stomach. Both of these may help us over time better control our appetite. Adding in fiber to that meal can also reduce that postprandial or post meal blood sugar response and feel far more satisfying too, as the additional volume can impact on immediate satiety. But not in all studies though, as the additional volume can impact on immediate satiety, though it's fair to say this isn't found in all studies. What we do know is that it, having in a substantial meal with plenty of calories to break the fast can really help satiety as energy density is also an important fact, factor. And this is one time and again that comes up. Remember, when you are restricting the window with which you eat, you'll be eating less frequently. And therefore, for most people, there will, be, there will need to be an increase in calories in these meals. You can still achieve a calorie deficit this way. And you might find that actually focusing a lot of your calories in that meal that breaks your fast will really change your appetite response. So you do end up easily eating less in subsequent meals and you'll be less likely to snack. And finally, if fasting, and I say this would be fair for any kind of calorie restriction approach, fasting or not, if it's difficult to adhere 
to during your luteal phase, then why not that week have a diet break where you bump up the calories or you don't fast that week on any day to help you manage overall sort of hunger and appetite. Many women experience an increase in cravings and overall hunger during their luteal phase in the lead up to their menstrual cycle or their bleeding. So instead of white knuckling and fighting that, give yourself both the psychological and physiological break from the calorie deficit and just lift your calories. These can be both from carbohydrate or fat calories and might only be about 10 or 20% of overall intake, but it will help you align the food that you eat with your appetite and you'll feel better. It is just one week and we do know that for some women there is in fact an increase in energy expenditure as well. So that's another reason why this sort of maintenance week can really work well during your luteal phase. Now, you will probably weigh a little bit more during this week. I mean, one, because it's your luteal phase and you, you may have an increased water retention and experience this anyway. But whenever you've got more food going in, the scales are going to go up. This doesn't mean it's a, a gain in body fat, though, particularly if you are still being mindful about what you're eating and it's this deliberate increase rather than a free for all for a week. It may make your fat loss phase a little longer, but it will also make it easier for you to adhere to overall. You'll also likely be better able to regulate your emotions at this time, and you'll probably make better food decisions because of this rather than, oh, just screw it, it's over, I'm just going to eat whatever. So while there is no particular regime that we know through science works best, for fasting during your mens fasting across your menstrual cycle, what we do know is that it can be effective for some women, particularly where metabolic health and blood sugar control is an issue. Fasting is a stress, so if it isn't working, then it may be that it's too stressful for you, or your behaviours in and around that fast that eating window actually diminish that calorie deficit because you are snacking too much, or you are less active because we've reduced your overall non-exercise activity thermogenesis. There are strategies, though, to mitigate these changes, and it's being more moderate with that fasting approach and being really intuitive about how it's working for you. When you're able to dial in an approach that works, fasting can then become another tool in your toolbox to help you create a calorie deficit if you're wanting to improve your body composition. So you certainly shouldn't just write it off because you hear that a woman should never fast. However, it's just being super intuitive and your own best investigator to figure out what's going to be best for you. And hopefully some of these tips have given you some ideas on how to navigate that. All right, team, catch you next week. 